This is the largest gathering of snakes in the world. Just outside of Winnipeg, Manitoba, are the Narciss snake dens. And at this time of year, they look like something straight out of Indiana Jones. Right now, about 75,000 snakes are emerging out of the ground with one goal in mind, sex. Well, sex and snacks. Snake sex. Why did it have to be snake sex? Hi, I'm Danielle Dufault, and you're watching Animal Logic. Today, I'm about to enter the Narciss snake dens in beautiful Manitoba, Canada. Wish me luck, or don't. I don't need it. I love snakes. The weather's been really slow to warm here in Manitoba, but today is a beautiful day. The sun is shining, feels nice and warm, and we are in for a treat. Cause look where I am. The Narciss snake dens are such an iconic place that they were nominated to be one of Canada's seven natural wonders. Though they didn't win because apparently people seem to prefer the Rocky Mountains over mountains made of snakes. Ridiculous if you ask me. And there it is, the first snake of the day. The species that congregates here is the red-sided garter snake, and they come here in the tens of thousands. So this is the first of many, hang on. To some people, this might look like something out of their nightmares. There are thousands of snakes coming out of their wintering dens, all at the same place and roughly at the same time. Narcisse has the highest density of snakes in the world. There are snakes as far as the eye can see. There are so many snakes that you can hear them too. Shh, listen closely. If you're very quiet, you can hear the snakes. You can hear them slithering across the dried up leaves and branches from last fall. I quite like the sound. These are a subspecies of the incredibly widespread garter snake genus. There are subspecies found all over North America, from the Northwest Territories in Canada to the Chihuahua Desert in Mexico. They live in a variety of environments, from the Eastern garter snakes who roam the forests of the Atlantic coast to the Puget Sound garter snakes who make their way through the rainforests of British Columbia, to the New Mexico garters who weather the arid conditions of the deserts of the American Southwest. They all look a little bit different from one another as they have each adapted to match all their respective environments. Let's take a closer look at these beauties. They're more colorful up close than you might think. Even though they're called red-sided, this population is mostly dark brown, with yellow stripes alongside their bodies. They're about 150 grams and are on average about a meter long, though older individuals can be much longer than that. These snakes are just coming out of a hibernation-like state called a brumation. In the fall, they hide here in massive groups and emerge in May when it's warm enough to mate and go hunting for amphibians in nearby marshes. Their location is a bit unexpected. Manitoba may be most well known as one of the best places to see polar bears and belugas, but it doesn't really come across as a snake haven. The secret to its snake hospitality? The rocks. Right now, we're standing on a massive deposit of water-worn limestone bedrock. These rocks are known to crack, forming deep tunnels that the snakes can use to escape the winter cold. Here in Manitoba, the winters are brutal, and the soil freezes a few meters below ground level. It's extremely cold. The air isn't that bad, but the wind out here is really intense. <sighs> Frozen soil is lethal to snakes, but the limestone cracks allow them to go deeper into warmer areas. Their depth is only limited by wet soil further below, called the water table, which is the upper limit of natural deposits of water. So their sweet spot is the pockets of air between the ice and the water. Very claustrophobic if you ask me, but they seem to like it. But enough talk of the winter blues. It's springtime! The frogs are croaking, the flowers are blooming, and the snakes are coming out to mate. And since they're just exiting their brumation, they are coming out starving from the winter. But 
They're not just hungry, they're hungry for love. Oh, they're, they're flocking this way. Oh, they're after her. So the female's making her escape, but she's not gonna be leaving alone. Those males are courting her hard. Wow, I guess it's warm enough today that the snakes are finally starting to feel pretty frisky. You can see there's a mating ball starting to happen down here. Now it's fair to bet that the biggest snake in that ball is the female, and all the little ones slithering all over it are pursuant males. Unfortunately, this can be quite a problem for them, as there is a large sex imbalance. There can be between 10 and 100 males for each female, so the competition is fierce. Older and larger females are more fertile and attract the largest, hottest, and most powerful males. While trying to mate, they'll wrap around her and lift her tail with their own tails. Yes, snakes have tails. And try to copulate. As nice as it is to have your choice of mate, it can be a huge hassle for the females, who at this point are way more interested in food than the boys trying to slither into their DMs. Things are even tougher for younger females. Sometimes they essentially get kidnapped and can't get away until they mate with their male kidnappers. Females under the age of three are usually infertile, but they get harassed by the boys anyway. This limits their chances of survival as it delays their return to their feeding grounds. Another fun fact about these guys is that the male garter snake has not one, but two penises, also called the hemipenes which is also what Vin Diesel's car in Fast and the Furious has. Some males have skin oils with female pheromones, and they too get chased by other males, which they purposefully lead astray and then return to the females, now with less competition. So he's flicking his tongue out, and the reason they stick their tongue out is to try and taste pheromones in the air. Obviously, I don't have any snake pheromones to communicate with him, but, uh, you know, he's trying. Communication is key in every relationship, don't you know? These males with female pheromones are thought to have more reproductive success than other males. And for decades, this was considered a great example of sexual mimicry. But more recent studies have pondered whether the pheromones were there all along, and males actually adapted to not have the pheromones in order to avoid being chased by other males. It's kind of a chicken or the egg type of situation. In any case, the females do everything they can to avoid all these snaky boys and get back to their pond as quickly as possible and find some grub. After all, at this point, they haven't eaten in months. Speaking of food, garter snakes hunt a wide variety of prey. Living in such disparate locations, each subspecies specializes in whatever is most available in their habitat. Garter snakes from the west coast have even adapted to eat poisonous rough-skinned newts, one of the most poisonous amphibians in the world. These amphibians produce a neurotoxin called tetrodotoxin, which is the same poison that pufferfish use. In some populations, they can have enough of it to kill 10 to 20 humans. But garter snakes are built differently, and they can catch and eat them, though they usually get lethargic and cold after digesting their prey. These snakes are the only animal known to eat rough-skinned newts and live to taste the tail. And even more so, some of the tetrodotoxin stays in the body of the snake, making it also poisonous to predators. There are a lot of predators, from crows to owls to large frogs. There is some safety in numbers, but the sheer amount of easy-to-catch snakes tends to draw a lot of predators. And who can blame them? If my favorite food started magically popping up out of the ground, I'd be waiting too. A lot of predatory birds like to snack on these snakes. And if you look up in the trees, sometimes you'll find a snake hanging from a branch with precisely its liver missing from its body. Somehow, that's what the birds are really after. It's like shucking an oyster. You eat the good soft parts on the inside and leave the hard husk on its own. Garter snakes, though relatively docile, are not completely defenseless. When threatened, they can snap, 
take a threatening pose, or try to make a speedy getaway. Contrary to popular belief, garter snakes do have venom. It's just not as toxic as other snakes in their range, like rattlesnakes. But they can still cause pain and irritation. Unfortunately, garter snakes are sprinters, not marathon runners. And younger snakes in particular will get exhausted quickly and become easy pickings for their predators. Given all their issues, it seems as though they should have been eaten to extinction by now. But luckily, they're really good at reproducing. Although most reptiles lay eggs, the garter snake is one of those rare exceptions because they give birth to live young. One mature snake can give birth to up to 40 little snakes in one go. Although garter snake babies are born in summer, they don't return home to mom and dad's den until a year later, after they strike out and discover their own snaky independence. But since there are relatively few females, each of them is crucial to the survival of the species. Some populations have disappeared or become just a very tiny fraction of what they were due to the extirpation of females. Pest control affects them because even if they don't eat the poison, sometimes they catch prey that has consumed it, becoming poisoned themselves. In 1999, the population in Narciss crashed due to extremely bad weather, as well as the fact that for many years leading up to the crash, over 10,000 snakes were run over every single year. Fortunately, humans are trying to do right by these snakes now, and have created these tunnels that go through and under the roads so they can safely pass. With the tunnels in place, now fewer than a thousand snakes get run over every year. In addition to this, habitat destruction due to limestone mining has completely collapsed some of their denning sites. Luckily, some areas like this one in Narciss are fully protected and hopefully will continue to be a haven for the beautiful red-sided garter snake. So I think it's time to leave these snakes alone so they can get on with their mating and go on their way. This has been an incredible experience, and I highly would recommend anyone to come and see them and support the science that the people here are doing. So what should we talk about next, little buddy? Please let me know in the comments, and be sure to subscribe for new episodes every week. Thanks for watching, and See ya! Oh cool! It's a cloaca!